Hey there, everyone. Huzzah, and welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller, Chief Market Strategist at Stock Charts. Today, we're going to talk about the S&P pushing back higher to 4,200. The VIX drifting lower, almost down to 18 after being over 20 last week. Tony Dwyer of Canaccord Genuity is going to be joining us. Is this a short-term bounce worth playing? Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hey everyone, welcome to the final bar. So glad you could join us. I'm Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Happy Halloween. Hope you guys are celebrating uh, safely and well. We're having a great time here on the Stock Charts TV office and uh, desperately trying to take things seriously on a Halloween uh, afternoon. You know, as we're looking at these markets, a lot of, uh, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of, uh, a lot of question marks, but at the end of the day, certainly seeing a tactical rally off of the lows. We saw from Friday's weakness, really uh, Thursday, Friday, finishing the position of weakness. Monday, Tuesday, really trying to recover and push back to, uh, to the upside. We have a great guest today, Tony Dwyer, to help us connect the short-term reversal we may be seeing with some of the longer-term themes that we've been addressing really through most of the year. The Fed and rising interest rates, uh, Treasury and, and what they will be doing. Uh, we have a Treasury auction coming up uh, here on Wednesday. Uh, earnings and what's happened. We have Apple coming up uh, later this uh, or uh, other earnings through the course of this week and beyond. So thinking about the impact of these different influences and how they relate to the short term, potentially a shift in sentiment, I think is the game here in late October as we rack October and get into uh, November. Let's get right to our market recap and see how things have played out. Focus on some of the evidence that the markets have provided back to us. Before we do that, by the way, we asked you guys in our uh, social media accounts, on our YouTube channel and elsewhere, what do you think the Fed does at this week's meeting? Raise rates, keep rates the same, lower rates. 3% of you, an aggressive call and a very unlikely call that the Fed would be lowering rates, uh, but I appreciate the, uh, the effort. 75% of, of you, basically three out of four, saying uh, keeping rates the same. When you look at the futures market, of course, pricing in sort of no change to, uh, to rates, sort of a you know, slight, uh, I would say, percentage similar to the results of the poll here is sort of what the market is pricing in the futures market is pricing in for the December meeting, which should come up about six weeks out from uh, from this week. Uh, so a lot of question marks to be to be sure. I think the Fed this week, of course, it'll be a lot about the, uh, the the press conference afterwards, what sort of language we hear, what sort of hawkish or less hawkish tone we get from Powell and, uh, and others as we go through the course of this week. Let's look at the charts and see how things have, uh, have played out. The S&P, as I mentioned, Almost getting to 4,200, not quite getting up there, but making a decent effort of it. So finishing the day right around 4,194, and that's up 0.7% from Monday's close. So pretty nice, uh, pretty nice follow through to the upside after Monday's gain. Uh, a little more today. The Nasdaq Composite up half a percent to 12,850. Mid caps, small caps, uh, all up as well. And small caps, of course, bouncing off of a pretty significant long-term support level here in the last uh, six to 12 months. The VIX pushing back to the downside, it kind of had an 18 handle, almost looked like it was going to get down to uh, 17 and change. Now, if you think about this, the VIX coming off of the high last week, I think is pretty important. When you think about a tactical rally and what sort of guideposts confirm that that's what's happening. Volatility lessening as a market rallying certainly is, uh, is a part of that. I would argue looking for the VIX to push back above 20, that could be the sign that this uh, sort of tactical rally may be over. Uh, but keep an eye on the VIX. For now, uh, volatility coming down a bit. Looking at interest rates, kind of a mixed bag uh, and not a significant change from yesterday. I would argue most likely in this sort of environment, you have a lot, new, a lot of news coming out with the Fed, with the Treasury, and, uh, and so forth this week. So probably a wait-and-see uh, time for the bond markets. Ten-year yield holding steady around 488. Uh, long bond yields around 502. And the five-year point around 482. The TLT actually went down about half a percent today, and the dollar index pushing up. The UUP actually uh, finished today just above $30 a share for that ETF. Looking at the commodity space, a lot of red here, and we talked about the rise in gold in October. October was a pretty strong month for gold uh, with a nice move to, uh, uh, to a new swing high. Uh, spot gold, of course, threatening uh, all-time highs around $2,100 an ounce, but pulling back here so far this week. The GLD was down about 0.6%. The silver ETF SLV was down 1.7%. The broader commodity ETF down slightly, about a third of a percent uh, for the DBC. Finally, cryptocurrencies uh, rallying here going through the equity session, but overall Bitcoin is still below 35,000. Now that's up 
quite a bit from that breakout level. We talked about 30, 31,000 being that significant level of resistance for quite some time. Really started in April, retested over the summer, and now once again uh, testing, but this time breaking through. You're seeing a lot of uh, sort of pent up optimism getting released, I think, in Bitcoin uh, pushing to the upside. Ethereum, uh, just about 1,800 to uh, finish the equity trading day. You know, looking at sectors is always an interesting sort of uh, juxtaposition of risk on versus risk off. You see the S&P and the NASDAQ finishing higher, which on the surface seems pretty encouraging. Your top three sectors are real estate, financials, and utilities. Now, two of those are pretty defensive sectors, particularly REITs up about 2%, utilities up 0.9%. Those are not really offensive sectors. They're more low volatility, more defensive sectors. Financials actually uh, bouncing up 1%, but of course, financials are coming off of a very beaten down level. Some of those major banks coming through earnings really got uh, really got uh, pushed to the downside. So a lot of the names that are gaining the most are, are areas of the market that have been underperforming, starting to get a mean reversion move to, uh, to the upside. On the lower end of the return list today, all 11 S&P sectors uh, up on the day, but energy, consumer staples, materials, all underperformed the S&P. Uh, energy, the worst, up about a third of a percent. Staples, not too far uh, away from that. Let's go to the daily chart of the S&P 500, just see how things kind of uh, played out. So this is that sort of decline that we've been talking about, this distribution phase, as I, as I like to call it. And, and again, just look as you take a step back from your monitor, look at how things changed from the first two thirds of this chart going back to uh, you know, uh, uh, September, August of last year, uh, through the right third of this chart, which is where you see lower highs and lower lows. You see support levels not holding, but being broken. We have this head and shoulders topping pattern and, you know, arguably we've gotten really close to that downside objective, which is around 4080. We didn't technically get there yet, but, uh, but pretty, pretty close. So you've had this distribution phase. We've now seen a breakdown. We've seen some follow through. But what you have to remember is any sort of market decline, you always have to be ready for what we call a bear market rally. And the three words that I would use to describe a bear market rally, sudden, severe and seductive. So bear market rallies usually come off of a big new low, like we saw on Friday. Usually get this big swing back to the upside as some initial buyers start to come in. Um, it's severe because it's usually not a gentle incline. It's not a gentle rotation back higher. Usually has some big up days. And what's funny is if you look back at market history, some of the biggest one day gains happen during bear markets, right? Because those big counter trend moves actually happen during a longer term downtrend phase. So the, the bear market rallies are often uh, severe. And they're seductive, right? It is super tempting in early October, in late August, to see these rallies off of a new swing low and think, okay, now we're headed back to all-time highs. And that's why one of my mentors, Ralph Akampora, would say, in a bearish phase, what you need to do is watch the highs, right? Do we keep making lower highs? We will have rallies, what we call a counter-trend rally, right? A mean reversion back to the upper end of these trend channels. And the question is, do we make a lower high? And as long as we keep making lower highs, things just aren't getting good enough to probably deserve your attention uh, in terms of a broader rotation higher. So at this point, I'm inclined to label this as a counter trend rally until proven otherwise. And I think, you know, things getting back above their 200 day moving average, which most things are not. Things getting above trend line resistance with a chart like Netflix actually is, but most are not. Those are the kind of things you may want to be looking for uh, here in this uh, in this environment. For, for now, it certainly seems like a bounce off of a new low within a downtrend channel that we've been uh, that we've been talking about. I did want to bring up a chart of the QQQ. We don't look up the, at the Qs too often. We talk about the Nasdaq in general, but uh, you know, haven't really focused on this chart. And what strikes me is that at the chart of the uh, the Qs here is just a, a real consistent downtrend channel. And what a downtrend channel is is just a parallel move of lower highs and lower lows. I drew this first trend line off of the July and August highs. You can see that lines up really well with the September and October highs. That's one of the ways you can kind of validate a trend line is you draw between the first two points and then a bunch of other points just start to line up with that. It really shows you what a good visual representation it is of the decline in, in price. Then I did a parallel line and look at how that lines up really well with the lows in August and the lows here from last week. So the Qs are actually in a very classic downtrend channel of lower highs and lower lows. And, you know, the general way to think of this sort of pattern is the price is going lower until you violate that channel to the upside. So you need to get all the way up here to around 370 on the Qs to break out of that downtrend channel uh, to the downside or, or to the upside. Now, what's interesting is, is if you look at where things have come from 
and where they're headed. We have the 200-day moving average looming very large below current levels, around 30, uh, 340, we'll call it 339. You also have the first Fibonacci support level. If you take the December low and the July high, 338 is about that level. So you have a confluence of support right below current levels, really right below uh, last, uh, last week's low. I think it came on Thursday for the Qs. So what that means is pretty reasonable to expect to bounce off of this sort of uh, pullback after the retracement that we've seen, retracing again about uh, just over a third of the way down uh, to, the, uh, to the, uh, the low from the beginning of this year. But if and when we break through that level, I think that would validate a press to the downside and suggest maybe further, uh, further downside to come. Now, we mentioned, of course, uh, the, uh, the Fed meeting coming up this week. Again, we have one of, our, one of my favorite guests in this sort of week when we have some macro uh, insights that we want to take, uh, you know, sort of uh, address and focus on someone like Tony Dwyer, uh, who better to help us kind of navigate this, uh, this environment. But just to set the stage for that discussion, I would argue rates are still in an uptrend. Now, you've seen a bounce in bond prices. You've seen the TLT, which has a, uh, what's called a bullish momentum divergence. You're seeing lower lows in bond prices but higher lows in momentum. On the other side of this, you're seeing higher highs in the yield, uh, but, but weaker momentum. And this usually suggests a bit of a, of a pullback. So the charts are kind of telling you that rates have gone up a lot. You probably expect a bit of a pullback. Bond prices have been going down for a lot, a bit of a mean reversion to the upside. Uh, but we really haven't seen enough of that follow through on the chart of the 10-year uh, the yield. And if we do get a bit of a pullback, I would argue we're still in a long-term uptrend of higher highs and higher lows uh, for the 10-year yield. Of course, 5% has ended up being a pretty, uh, pretty meaningful level. We hit there uh, a couple weeks ago and now have pulled back. And the question I would argue for, for this chart, do we get that next new high? Do we get above 5%? And if so, I think that suggests further, uh, further moves in that direction from a technical perspective. To finish off our market recap, let's look at some individual names uh, you know, in uh, earnings, a lot of earnings to, to uncover. And as a reminder, we have some great earnings calendar sort of tools and earnings anal analytical tools on the Stock Charts platform. We do have an earnings calendar. If you're not familiar, go to Charts and Tools. And on the right, this is where you can find some of the uh, really cool features that I think a lot of people are, are underappreciating. Earnings calendar is one of them. So you can look at a particular list. You can look at an index see when those companies that are of interest to you are reporting earnings, just so you can make sure you plan your strategy around some of those key potentially market moving dates. Now, JetBlue uh, reporting today, as you can see, gapping lower down about 10 and percent. So not a great reaction to earnings. But what I wanted to highlight is a pretty bullish uh, candle pattern. And what this candle is, is called a hammer candle. And if you're not familiar with candle charts, if you're on the show and you're watching this, you probably have some of the seen, seen some of these before. But as a refresher, if you're not familiar, a hammer candle is something that happens during a downtrend. So step one is we are going down, which we clearly are with most of the, if not all of the airlines. Then you have this sort of candle where the open and the close are near the upper end of the range. There's very little of what you call an upper shadow or an upper upper stem. There's, so, so basically the open and close are near the upper end of the trading range. Then you have a long lower shadow. So think about what happened during today's trading. You open, you trade all the way down to 340, but by the close, you're back up to 376. So think about it. It's basically shaped like a V. You had initial selling out of the open. You had buyers come in midday and push the price back up toward the highs for the day. That's why the hammer candle is one of the most popular reversal candles in a downtrend because it tells you that during the day, some buyers are coming in. It's a tactical uh, buy signal. So it's interesting that JetBlue gapped lower. You actually did see buyers come in through the course of the trading day. And the question is, I would argue tomorrow, do you get upside follow through? Do you see additional buyers coming in willing to pay more for JetBlue after this sort of reset in valuations, right? Yesterday's close was 420. We're obviously well below that, but you're seeing some initial buyers come in on the, uh, on the weakness. So on the chart of something like uh, JetBlue, what strikes me is we've been in a pretty significant downtrend for quite some time. You can see that uh, airlines have been underperforming the S&P fairly consistently. So you're just looking for signs of capitulation, signs of a reversal. Uh, Tom Boley was in our studio last week. We talked about looking for some of those signs of capitulation for the major averages as well. Maybe for JetBlue, we're seeing it, uh, we're seeing it here. Now, what's interesting is on some of the other airlines, you'll find a consistent theme, which is they're going down. Airlines have not been a particularly strong group. What's interesting is back here in June and July, they're making a new swing high, breaking out. Seemed incredibly encouraging, setting up for a summer into a fall of uh, you know, the great return of airlines as, the, uh, as a trading opportunity was not to be. And you can see that uh, ended up being a fail breakout quickly soon after American Airlines gapped lower 
And then it's been just a consistent move lower uh, through the course of, uh, of this time. What I want to highlight on the chart of the AAL is a bullish momentum divergence. Lower lows September and October. But look at how the momentum is actually sloping higher. And it's not just... Uh, you know, American Airlines, others uh, as well. Alaska Airlines, which is the biggest uh, carrier here in the Seattle area. Again, lower lows. Look at how the momentum declining, momentum accelerating to the downside really through September. But in October, we keep making lower lows, but the momentum is starting to dissipate. So, you know, again, is this telling you that the bottom has happened? Uh, not necessarily. It's sort of one of those leading indicators in the technical toolkit telling you we may be getting to that exhaustion point. What I would always be looking for is a sign of accumulation, a sign that buyers are coming in, a higher low, a sign that we're now right, rotating higher and coming out of that oversold uh, region may be the setup that we've been waiting for on airlines that have been, again, some of the worst performing uh, groups here in, uh, in the last couple of months. Looking quickly at biotech, we highlighted, I think, yesterday the chart of the IBB uh, and, and, and recognizing uh, some of the changes we've seen in the biotech space. Amgen is, uh, is another earnings name uh, here this week, down about 3% on earnings today. Again, sort of trading lower, but you know, getting some buyers to come in through the course of the day. What's interesting about the chart of Amgen is it actually was testing a new high uh, earlier this month, right? In October, you actually saw a retest of the November 2022 high around 287, we'll call it. We got right back up to that level, but then we rotated lower. So stocks that are testing resistance, uh, what I often say, trading to resistance, but not through resistance, are often, uh, uh, often a, a reminder that there are, I guess, a signal that there's not that upside momentum that you want to see to get us to new highs. And Amgen, for now, really pulling off of those previous uh, swing highs below the 50-day moving average. I'd want to see it regain that uh, to take that chart any more seriously than I am. Other earnings coming up uh, today into tomorrow. We have AMD, another semiconductor name. We had a number of them. Uh, Mpower was, was one uh, as well. And the chart of the SMH, the chart of semiconductors, and really maybe the chart of AMD, sort of in these similar downtrend channels, right? The big rally into the summer and then lower highs and lower lows. That pattern has to change. You're not really getting any sort of divergence here. I think the chart is just still going lower. We've gone below the 200-day moving average. And really the question is, do we get enough uh, buying momentum to push back above the 200-day, maybe get above a trend line, taking those recent highs from the last uh, six months? Finally, first solar. We had SolarEdge uh, last week, if I remember right, not a particularly strong earning uh, quarter, uh, and uh, the stock got, uh, got dinged pretty good for it. First solar actually up 4.5% today. What's interesting is you actually have a bullish candle reversal pattern here with yesterday into today. You also have a bullish momentum divergence. So when the market is going lower, I think you have a couple of things to look at from a technical perspective, and it starts with the leading indicators. Where do you see divergency? Stocks making new lows on higher momentum. I would say with First Solar, some of the other names we've talked about, like some of the airlines, you may be seeing that. Now it's a question of whether you get the upside follow through, those signs of accumulation that would tell you things perhaps starting to get a little bit better. That's our market recap for today. And again, a lot of things coming up with uh, the next couple of days with the Fed, the Treasury, and so forth. We have a great guest today, Tony Dwyer, to help us make sense of what's to come. Before we bring Tony on, just a quick reminder, we have the live chat going during our shows here on YouTube. Uh, so make sure you drop any questions that come up during our broadcast. We'll gather all of those and put them in the mailbag. We had a fun live Q&A on this show yesterday. Every Monday, we'll do a live Q&A uh, as well. You can also email us your questions. The final bar at stockcharts.com is the best way to get your questions to us any time of the day or night. Don't forget to like our uh, video and uh, um, subscribe to our YouTube channel while you're here as well. It would help us out a great deal. I want to bring on today's guest, Tony Dwyer. Tony's the chief market strategist at Canaccord Genuity, coming to us live from the New York area. Tony, how are you? Good to see you. Great to see you, Dave. Thanks for having me, buddy. So there's a lot happening. We've talked about some of the technical implications, and you brought some charts with you to tell us about sort of your take on this tactical, uh, tactical rally. Start us off, though, big picture. We've got a lot going on this week, but we've been continuing to think about the dominance of the mega caps. That's been one of the key themes in 2023. When you look at that sort of uh, you know, how that has played out in 2023, what does that tell you about the conditions here at the end of October? I think, Dave, what's really the most interesting thing is we hear a lot in the media and on here and everywhere else, you know, we quote the market, which is quoted as the S&P 500. When you think back to when you and well, I got in the business a little bit before you, but when I got in the business, the debate was, do you use the Dow Jones Industrial Average or do you use the S&P 500? Because the Dow Jones Industrial Average was too highly concentrated. It was only 30 names. 
when you want to use 500. So fast forward to today, now that everybody's adopted the S&P 500, the top 10 stocks in the S&P 500 account for more than a third of the market capitalization. And we've all heard what, if you take out the top seven stocks in earnings or performance, how bad it is, but it's really bad. <laughs> the average 65%, according to my friends at Ned Davis, 65% of stocks are down 20% or more from their 52 week high. This says of last Friday, it's close, right? Yeah. Um, you've got the average stock is down 33% from the 52 week high. That's not even, Dave, I'm not talking about the all time high. I'm talking about the 52 week high. Mm. So the damage under the surface has been extraordinary. And as you know, my reputation historically is kind of to be the perma bull and always to be optimistic. But that's I've been pretty cautious for the better part of two years now. Mm. The market peaked back in January of 2022. And the reason that, you know, people don't really remember me from 08, um, the great financial crisis or the dot com bust like you might. But there's periods when you want to be cautious, and those periods are when interest rates are going against you. And the recent backup in rates, I think, is coming from a place that now is becoming consensus to talk about, mm. but really drove it with supply and demand, what we talk about here on StockCharts.com. Yeah, it's amazing how much the mega caps dominate. And I feel like, again, uh, on the institutional side, I feel people have a, a much often a much greater awareness of those overweights and what they mean. I, I hope individual investors watching this show can you know, better and better appreciate why it's important to focus on the, uh, the weightings of those indexes. You know, getting to your point about how for the average stock, it's not been a particularly strong year. The first chart you're bringing with you is just looking at stocks above key moving averages, incredibly low, right, for the cycle. Does this give you confidence of a tradable rally here or what's your takeaway? So what we're going to go through here, Dave, is the four key tactical indicators. You you have a ton of indicators. You've forgotten more about technical analysis than I'll ever know. Um, but the truth is you could use 50 indicators. I use four because in the four that we're going to look at cover short term um, internals, short term sentiment, intermediate term um, oscillator using the weekly stochastic. And then lastly, um, the uh, uh, investor sentiment. So this one, what you're looking at here is a very important one from a trading standpoint for me. The top half is the S&P 500. Um, you can see it's in a downtrend, but if you drew your downtrend channel like you did on the other chart you did, you're at yep. the bottom end of that channel. Yep, right? agreed. And at agreed. the same time, the percentage of stocks above their 10 and 50 day moving average hit a low extreme as of last Friday. So the, these charts are, as you know, all of when we we took a, a tactical positive trade on Monday morning. Um, and it comes, it's really the one here is when the percentage of stocks above the 50 day dropped to 10%, that's pretty extreme as you can see on the chart. Yeah. Now it doesn't mean that's your bottom tick in stocks, but it's an environment that's ripe for a rally, which was the title of our note. Talk to us about the change in the VIX, because we talk about the VIX spiking above 20. That's sort of a danger, red flag that pops up for me. What does that tell you about the conditions here? That's exactly right. But I wanted to add something onto it because that got popular. Yeah. Um, I looked at the 10-day rate of change on the VIX. Uh -huh. And when it gets, what you really want to see is when it gets above 40, to especially 50, depending upon the context of the market. I don't know why that hit me. It just kind of did. Um, the VIX above 20 shows that there's certainly an increase in fear. But out of the four indicators we're going to look at, this one's the, the one that says you didn't get extreme. You got you're close. So VIX above 20 showing fear, but not an extreme in fear. And that's corroborated by the 10 day rate of change, which is not anywhere near that level that typically warrants some kind of immediate action. It's a heads up, kind of like the other one. It's a heads up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, I like that one. All right, now talk about momentum, which is currently, I mean, pretty low. It's starting to bounce a little bit through the course of this week. Does this give you confidence in a bit of a reversal then, I would assume? So, Dave, when you look at that chart, right, what did it show you from May to July? You're breaking out in an uptrend on the top yep. half, right? That that's, a, that's an accelerating uptrend. Everybody got very excited, and now it failed. <laughs> it's pulling back. The oscillator on the bottom is the 14 week stochastic. I, 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 this is a personal view. In a world of algorithm trading, quant trading, and passive investing, I think price can be misleading at times anymore. So I look more mm -hmm. for extremes and, and I guess momentum price 
Yeah. And this is what the weekly stochastic does when it's over 80 you're overbought. When you're at a hundred, you're, you're really overbought. Yeah. And when you're below 30, you're oversold. Now here's what I want to point out. Um, that weekly stochastic is pretty oversold. To give you context, on Friday's close, you got to go back to the low in 2022, the October low, and then the Christmas Eve massacre before it. Yeah. But to get to the same level prior to that, you'd have to go to the GFC, the Great Financial Crisis. Wow. That's as of Friday's close. So we're up 2%. I'm going to pull it up in front of me while we're on air here, not on the screen, but in front of me. We're up 2% this week. Yeah. Up 2%. OK, the weekly stochastic is in the single digits at seven point six seven. So it doesn't get worse, even in bear <laughs> markets, you get bounces now. So the question becomes, Dave, is it going to be a one or two week bounce like in a bear market yeah. or is it going to be the low like in 2022 or 2008 in late 2018? Yeah. And as you know, I, I think we haven't. Um, we have an interest rate problem and a, and a liquidity problem. So I don't think it necessarily is the low, but it's a tradable low. Interesting. Now, your last chart really gets to more of the sentiment. We, we highlighted on the show the name exposure index, which bounced a little bit, bounced above 60 there uh, you know, over the last couple of weeks, but now back yeah. down to in the 20 percent range. What does this tell you about sort of uh, sentiment uh, here at the end of October? Everybody was kind of shaking their heads at that 60 something reading as the market's getting hit. Yeah. Um, but here's an interesting data point. My associate, Mike Welch, who's our technician here uh, in my group, he pointed out to me that that was the fastest drop to, in from 66 down to the biggest one week drop since January of 2008. Wow. Please note, January of 2008 wasn't the low, but it was tradable low. And I think that's what we have to pay attention to here. Um, it does, and, and frankly, it doesn't really matter. Our whole call is based upon an improvement in the interest rate environment um, creates that coupled with these oversold chart and pessimistic charts. It creates an environment right for a rally. Just three weeks ago, we had a 5% jump. Yeah. And pe you know, people very quickly forgot that. So we, we're in the midst of this oversold rally. It's truly, for me, going to be about interest rates on, on as the catalyst. Uh, and we got a bunch of them in the next three days. Yeah. So you mentioned it's sort of the short term tactical call. Can't disagree. A lot of these technical uh, indicators we would look at very oversold and, and ripe for a bounce. But the medium term, long term call is still an interest rate call. We have the Treasury auction uh, this week. We've got the Fed meeting. What are you expecting to hear? What do you think, what additional data points are we looking for this week to help understand interest rates going forward, how that impacts stocks? Tim, if you gave me the data, I don't know how to trade it. <laughs> Unless you're at a true, now that we're up 2%, it's a tougher call going into tomorrow. When you're washed out like we were Friday and the percentage of stocks above the 10 and 50 day, when the VIX is at 21 instead of the close of 18 today, it's it's really more about the oversold condition. We're not as oversold anymore. So I think right. it's a harder call. I don't think that the – so the Fed um, Treasury announcement tomorrow morning at 830. That, I doubt, is going to be a real negative for bonds. The, between taxes and the prior amount that was issued – they they kind of gave an early heads up yesterday that it's a little bit below what the consensus was. I don't think Janet Yellen's going to surprise Wall Street with a huge new issuance above and beyond what was expected, like what happened in July. You can timestamp July peak in the S and P five hundred to her announcement mm -hmm. of a trillion dollars, which was a third more than expected. Now everybody's talking about that, yeah. but I think it's pretty well discounted there. And then, of course, I don't think the Fed's going to do too much out of the ordinary, given how financial conditions have tightened uh, when they do their press conference tomorrow. You know, when you're looking at the yield curve, one of the charts that we've focused, uh, that, we've, that we've highlighted on the show before, is looking at the shape of the yield curve, looking at twos versus tens. Obviously, the yield curve has mm -hmm. been inverted for quite some time. Twos versus tens, though, almost kind of getting back to a normal shape. How important is that in terms of it, or, or is it a different comparison, tens versus three month or something like that, that you think tells the story of the shape of the yield curve and, and getting out of this inverted uh, situation? So you know how people talk about the 10, it's how weird the 10 year note yields going up like it is, and that's the yeah. reason it's disinverting. You got to look at the 65 through 85 market. The 10 year bond yield made its peak 
in the heart of the recession of the four recessions that took place from 1965 to 1985. It made it in the recession. And that was as you were disinverting the yield curve. So the problem, and I really, I really want to stress this. I'm not that smart. I know a lot of smart people like yourself. I know that when something's happened and every time, every cycle, people say it's different, yet it's worked every single cycle. <laughs> you, you know, you guys all have the greatest research analysts just like me. The new analyst I have is Google. Google mm -hmm. it. Just yeah. check, say, soft landing Bernanke, soft landing Yellen, soft landing Greenspan, and see what comes up. It's not different each time. We want to make it different, but it's not. One it's last question. Yeah. When it disinverts, guess what happens? You go into a recession and it's a sell signal. You know, one one last question just to wrap up, Tony, quickly. Uh, you know, we talked about the dominance of mega caps. How about the lack of participation in small caps? That's been another sort of narrative in 2023. Small the IWM or the Russell 2000, it's kind of testing the lower end of the range. How important is it, in your opinion, to see small caps participating as part of a broader recovery story? I think it's very important because it improves the breadth of the market. It includes the financials, which is yeah. a key um, key part of it. Um, that said, you had a great move out of the Russell 2000 over the summer. I called it the hustle of the Russell, um, and it failed. So I think we'd like to make up a lot of things, and it sounds smart, and we can log off the machine, and it sounded smart. Ultimately, I think what it really comes down to is the driver of the market is earnings, and those yeah. earnings are driven by money availability. Interest rates are at the peak of the cycle for, for treasuries, corporates, and mortgages. It's hard for me to say that the money availability and the outlook for money is improving. So the weakness in the Russell, yeah, rates come down and that's our call is that we called it higher for shorter. If rates come down, the first move of that is going to be, wow, that's great. The Fed will be done, right? That might give a lift to stocks, but ultimately this ends with bad news being bad news. When the outlook for earnings worsens, you're starting to see it in some of the corporate reports where they beat expectations. And then the stocks get smoked in the aftermarket because of the guidance. We're getting toward the end, folks. When we've had two years of a bear market and the participation is so bad and so weak, it's closer to the end than the beginning. But one more push, will, you know, in our view, will do it as long as rates come down. Tony, so good to see you. Thanks for dropping some incredible wisdom on us, sharing some insights. Be well, stay safe, keep the blue side up, and we'll talk to you again soon. <laughs> Absolutely. See you, buddy. Have a great day. That's Tony Dwyer. Tony's the chief market strategist at Canaccord Genuity. I love how, I mean, again, I've, I've known Tony for, for a while and I love uh, having conversations with him, thinking about how the charts relate to other, uh, other disciplines. And I think Tony, better than anyone, can take some, you know, confusing, uh, you know, inaccessible, uh, you know, economic and macro data and boil it down to some very actionable insights. I love that reinforcement. It's all about interest rates. This week, really tomorrow, we've got the Treasury auction, we have the Fed meeting, Maybe that gives us some additional colors. But at the end of the day, I would argue rates still kind of in an, in a, in an incline. Ten-year yield continuing to push higher. Great reminder to focus on uh, market history as well. Thanks so much, Tony Dwyer of Canaccord Genuity joining us. We've got to wrap the show. Go to the three in three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. Looking at Netflix, I mentioned the chart of the Qs with the S&P. You have this downtrend channel, which is when you know, prices are going lower, lower highs, lower lows. Now, the way that you exit a downtrend channel is because you break above trend line resistance. We're starting to maybe see that with Netflix. It's setting up to potentially break out, but it is not quite done so. So we'll have to look and see if we actually get that uh, upside follow through. What's interesting is if you look at other areas of the market like semiconductors, this is what a lot of other names kind of look like, right? And chart number two highlights the SMH in a downtrend channel, but at the lower end of the channel. So while Netflix is kind of at the upper end breaking out, that's what you want to see from charts like the SMH, other names that are in this downtrend channel. Can they get out of that channel to the upside? The more stocks that do that, the more you will hear me talk about a great recovery going into year end. Finally, breadth conditions. I thought Tony Dwyer did a brilliant job highlighting some of the concerning breadth readings, but maybe setting up for a tactical rally because of that 
weakness. The McClellan oscillator breaking above zero. The percent of stocks above their 50-day getting well above current levels, ideally above 50. The bullish percent index getting back above 30. Those are the three things I would be looking for on this chart to suggest to me the downtrend may be over and we are truly in a recovery phase. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Don't forget to like and subscribe the video before you go. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe. Happy Halloween.